Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri, and I'm one of the uh, adjunct uh, professor at the Department of Engineering Science and uh, one of the organizers of this lecture series. I would like to thank also Sharam Marivani and then uh, also Kate Lapp, uh, who are uh, helping us uh, with this uh, uh, I mean, uh, lecture series. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, especially our speaker, uh, for, in fact, uh, attending this uh, lecture series today. And uh, before we, I introduce our guest speaker, let me mention that uh, uh, Kate has ordered pizza, which is going to arrive at uh, uh, 5.30, hopefully. <laughs> and you then, uh, then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because sometimes it doesn't come. And then also that uh, the uh, next lecture will be on September the 6th, but as you see, that is all uh, TBD because uh, I have not, uh, I mean, usually I uh, go for the speakers in, in, in a summertime frame. Uh, our guest speaker for today is uh, Dr. Don uh, Strick, and the uh, title of his talk is uh, Why did Silicon Valley develop in the San Francisco Bay Area instead of the East Coast? All right. I got to say that this is uh, Dr. Street's uh, uh, third talk. In fact, uh, he gave us uh, a talk on restriction of hazardous substance in, uh, uh, in 2009. And, and another one, the invention of the integrated circuit in 2011. So that's now his, his uh, third talk. So I really appreciate that. Dr. Don Street is uh, currently an adjunct professor in the engineering science department. He has received his, his PhD, uh, um, I'm sorry, his, well, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering degree from UC Berkeley and his PhD from Stanford University in 1980. During the 1970s, he worked in Silicon Valley at Hewlett Packard Laboratories in Palo Alto. He worked for 30 years at Hewlett Packard's Technology Center later Agilent Technology on compound semiconductor integrated circuits and test and measurement inst instrumentations. He has been with Sonoma State University since 2010. And it's my pleasure to uh, ask him to take the floor. Thank you, uh, Professor Kajuri. How many of you have not heard of Silicon Valley? That's a loaded question because I know everyone has. So what that means is if I were to ask you what Silicon Valley is, you could tell me, right? We could try an experiment here with that question, or maybe not. So the first question I probably would pose is what is Silicon Valley? And this takes there. Well, this should be familiar. Google, Facebook, Yahoo. This is one way to define Silicon Valley today. And I included the Computer History Museum and Apple and Stanford University. And that's a very incomplete slide, obviously. You know that as well as I do. So that's one way to define Silicon Valley. I like the, uh, the Wikipedia definition. Silicon Valley is a nickname for the southern portion of the San Francisco Bay Area in the part of California known as Northern California. I like that play on words. Well, where is Silicon Valley? That's a little bit harder to define. Most people will say, well, it's in the Santa Clara Valley. And that includes going from San Jose, Cupertino, Santa Clara, Sunnyvale Mountain View, et cetera, Palo Alto. However, this is very deceptive because that's the heart of Silicon Valley, yes, but Silicon Valley has actually spread out much further, all the way down to Santa Cruz, over into Oakland, and a very significant part of Silicon Valley today is really in San Francisco, primarily software. Many companies are locating in San Francisco because young programmers like to live there. And by the way, houses are pretty expensive on the peninsula. So, but they're also expensive in San Francisco. 
Uh, well, we'll talk about that maybe later. Okay. So why should Silicon Valley have emerged elsewhere? Aaron Rao wrote a book called Second Edition Now, History of, uh, History of Hill, Silicon Valley, and he subtitled it, I love this subtitle, The Greatest Creation of Wealth in the History of the Planet. Now that should get your attention. I'm not sure that's absolutely true, but it's very interesting. And what he wrote was he said, if a historian was looking at a, the world a century ago, 100 years ago, where would they predict that Silicon Valley would emerge? Well, certainly not on a primitive, underpopulated, and undeveloped region like the San Francisco Bay Area. In fact, it was more likely happen around Boston or New York or Philadelphia, or perhaps in England between Oxford and Cambridge. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But the truth of the matter is Silicon Valley did emerge from this primitive, underpopulated, under, underdeveloped area. That actually turned out to be an advantage in the growth and formation of Silicon Valley. Well, until the 1960s, and Silicon Valley started to form long before the 1960s, most of the world's technology and financial centers were either in the East Coast or in Europe. For example, Bell Telephone Laboratories, East Coast, RCA Labs, IBM Research Labs, Cavendish Laboratory in England, the great universities, MIT, Harvard, etc., were not on the West Coast. Germany and Britain led the world in the most Nobel Prizes. Key inventions, Bell Labs, transistor invention. December 23, 1947, a tremendous Christmas present arrived at Bell Labs. Computer, well, this one is hard to understand. It was at the University of Pennsylvania where the ENIAC computer was. At Iowa State, actually the first digital electronic computer emerged. And in Europe, Conrad Zeus's work on the Z2 and Z3 and the Colossus during World War II in Great Britain those were major milestones. In fact, you can argue during the 1940s that Britain was the world's leader in computers. What happened? In two decades, they lost that. And of course, the financial strength was on Wall Street and in London. So this primitive, underdeveloped peninsula near San Francisco should not have been the place where this happened. Well, here's a clue. Chris Aaron wrote an article in Wired magazine entitled Sputnik Hippies and Disruptive Technology of Silicon Valley. And I'm going to submit to you that's a clue as to part of the reason why Silicon Valley emerged. He wrote other regions have tried to emulate the Bay Area, and they've done so with little success. So they've actually done it with some success around Route 128 in Boston, around Austin, around Georgia Tech. I had an opportunity to work with Georgia Tech uh, many years ago. The Georgia legislature pumped an incredible amount of money into the Atlanta area around Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech is a great engineering school, but it didn't really uh, produce that much result. So, and what Heron was saying Silicon Valley cannot be replicated without the prior history leading up to it. And that's what I call the, the uh, formative history of Silicon Valley, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and the way I'm going to divide that for you. This is a timeline from 1910 to the present, and it turns out there are waves of innovation that occurred in Silicon Valley or in the San Francisco Peninsula. I'm going to talk about the advent of vacuum tubes, microwave tubes, silicon. Well, we call it Silicon Valley for a reason, the silicon in transistors and integrated circuits. And that led to personal computers. And I'm not going to talk a lot about social media and the internet and the things that are emerging today. You probably know as much about a lot of those things as I do. 
But I'm going to make the claim that about this time, Silicon Valley had really been formed and its character had really been defined. And I've also indicated here particular wars. Yes, war was a major driver of Silicon Valley, especially World War II and the Cold War, which had two hot wars in between, the Korean and Vietnam War. And that turns out to be very, very important to understand. So we're going to talk about this in essentially five sections. We're going to start with the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, and the hero are the amateur radio operators. Might surprise you. I would claim that this Santa Clara Valley in the first half of the 20th century doesn't look like high technology, does it? This was very successful. Their agriculture for apricots and pears and other produce was amazingly successful. And until 1965, even with the advent of high technology, this was still the dominant source of income and revenue in the Santa Clara Valley. Here is the Santa Clara Valley back in 1914. I took this photo from Google thanks to Google, but you'll note, you don't see Google in that picture, do you? See, Google didn't exist in 1914 when the photo was taken. And another key point, 1900, Stanford University. Stanford University, founded in 1885 by Leland Stanford, because their son, Leland Stanford Jr., died, and they wanted to put something in place that made a contribution that would be in the memory of their son who died at an early age. And so Stanford, starting on October 1st of 1891, admitted their first students. By the way, until 19, around 1925, roughly about that time, 1923, Stanford was tuition free. It was a free university. It's no longer that. I, know, I looked up the tuition for next year, $50,700 tuition. Wow, I couldn't even afford to send my dog there. So I probably shouldn't have said that. I hope no one watches from Stanford. Okay, so we said amateur radio. Well, the setting is this. What was the big event in California around 1850? that transformed California. It's the gold rush. And do you think the gold rush drew a lot of people wanting to get rich? Yes. How do you get all of the supplies to these people? Clothing, food, tools. Well, you didn't have the railroads in 1850. Shipping. So San Francisco becomes a port, a major port in the United States. Now, ships find it very convenient to be able to communicate. How do you communicate in 1850 from a ship? Smoke signals, flags, shouting, not very effective. There was no radio. When Marconi came along, he started to show that there was a possibility to have wireless communication. And as a matter of fact, when the Titanic sunk in 1912, there was a radio station, a spark gap transmitter on the Titanic, and they sent out a message that they were sinking. No one heard it. So Congress mandated that all ships with 50 passengers or more would have a full-time, fully manned radio station on those ships. That was a huge boost to radio communication. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, because of the shipping, there were a lot of people that were interested in radio and especially caught the imagination of young people. And in fact, in the ninth, late 1910s and 1920s, there were a lot of people in this country that got into amateur radio. Not because that was their business, but it was a hobby. And they made significant contributions. In fact, sometime a little after 1910, 10% of all the radio amateurs in the United States were in the Bay Area. 
And that proves to be very important because some very key people became amateur radio enthusiasts. Now there's a culture involved with amateur radio. These hobbyists, and I've listed a few of them there like Itel and McCullough and uh, Charlie Litton, Cyril uh, Elway. <coughs> In fact, ITEL actually pioneered the 10 meter band that came out of the Bay Area. Lytton was the first ham radio operator to communicate with Australia and New Zealand from the United States. They were not only just pioneers, they were making significant technological contributions. And this culture among their amateur radio enthusiasts, enthusiasts were, it was an egalitarian culture. Everybody's equal if you're a ham operator. It doesn't matter what you do in life, when you're on the radio, everyone's an equal. They're incredibly enthusiastic about their hobby. They were very innovative. They want to communicate further. They want the sound quality to be better. They were very creative, and they took pride in their discussions and, dis and shared them with one another. And today, this is a characteristic of Silicon Valley. There's an immense amount of information sharing. That proves to be very important. And we'll get back to that later. There were two companies that were very important in that particular time period. One was Federal Telegraph. Has anyone here heard of that company? No longer around. But a young Stanford graduate, Cyril Elway, started this company, and by the way, the first angel capitalist on the West Coast, David Starr, uh, Starr Jordan, who was the president of Stanford University, helped fund the startup of Federal Telegraph, and some other professors at Stanford also chipped in. And what Elway did, Elwell did was he essentially worked on arc transmitters, which was a continuous wave communication as opposed to the old spark gap, which had to be more like a coded pulses. Continuous wave with the arc transmitters, you could actually transmit voice, and that was very desirable. And that was a very important contribution. And a little later, this Stanford graduate by the name of Charlie Litton came along and he proves to have made huge contributions in the ability to manufacture equipment for amateur radio operators. And we'll come back to him. Here is Federal Telegraph. This is their first building. There is a historical plaque citing this to be uh, one of the first electronic research laboratories. By the way, Lee DeForest also worked at Federal uh, Telegraph, and remember, he's the inventor of the triode vacuum tube, which made amplification of RF waves possible. So Steve Blank, who uh, is a, teaches at Stanford and UC Berkeley and several other universities, his comment I thought was very interesting. Maybe we need to reset our Silicon Valley birthday back to Federal Telegraph. It, turned out to be immensely important. It was a gathering point of amateur radio enthusiasts. It spun off other companies. It turns out to have been very, very important. And in fact, here is one of those ARC transmitters. On the right side is Elwell himself. And it's interesting, they established the first radio stations, broadcast radio stations in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Portland, Oregon. And what were they interested in doing? Communicating out to Hawaii and beyond. And they built these incredibly large, very powerful arc transmitters. The arc transmitter itself is actually here. They made them larger and larger. In fact, they made them so large that they the largest units would have dwarfed these three men, and they were approaching hundreds of kilowatts of power. A real achievement. Charlie Litton turns out to be incredibly important because not only was he involved in amateur radio, 
But he was a genius at manufacturing vacuum tubes for the radio enthusiasts. That was his goal, to serve them. And I'm going to tell you in a moment why that really turns out to be important. And in addition, looking forward, it's, this work is going to be incredibly important for World War II. Looking ahead a little bit. So Lytton was an incredibly masterful developer of manufacturing equipment. Now that turns out to be very important because after World War I, well, a war drove this, the United States Navy decided radio is incredibly important for us. And we're going to create a monopoly using RCA, a private company, along with General Electric, Westinghouse, and Western Electric from AT&T. And those four, that cartel, is going to dominate the vacuum tube industry in the United States. OK, big problem. The RCA cartel refused to sell vacuum tubes to West Coast companies. And that it wasn't just Federal Telegraph. It was many companies around Federal Telegraph. So they were shut out. So companies like Heinz and Kaufman, et cetera, they needed these vacuum tubes to continue producing radios. They had a challenge. See, with RCA's monopoly included about 250 really key patents. And you can make vacuum tubes, but you can't violate those 250 patents. That's very difficult. So they hired mostly amateur radio hobbyists to address this. And over a period of several years, they successfully did it. They got around all the patents and started to produce useful vacuum tubes. This is an example, Heinz and Kaufman. And with Charlie Litton, and the superb manufacturing techniques that he developed, it wasn't too long before these West Coast companies produced more reliable and longer life vacuum tubes than RCA did. They not only had gotten around the patents, they had done it in such a creative way that they were able to produce superior products. There's a lesson there. Well, the Depression was difficult for everybody. William Itell and Jack McCullough formed IMAC, a producer of vacuum tubes. They helped each other, remember this culture of sharing? They helped each other. And looking ahead, the IMAC tubes were used in the early radar work that came just in time for World War II. Federal Telegraph didn't survive, but I thought it was an interesting sidelight in the history that the magnets that they used in the ARC transmitters were given to UC Berkeley. And UC Berkeley, Ernest Lawrence, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on the cyclotron, those magnets made that possible. Along comes an in interesting individual, Fred Terman. You're going to hear a lot about him in the next few minutes. He arranged for Lytton during the Depression to start working with the Varian brothers, Russell and Sigurd, at Stanford University, and they developed the Klystron microwave tube, which turned out to be incredibly important for radar. Bottom line, the Bay Area and Stanford University became a microwave center for high-powered vacuum tubes. And they made the best vacuum tubes in the world. And that was going to prove to be incredibly important for radar and radar countermeasures. So this close cooperation and free exchange of information proved to be very useful. They were looking out for each other. Now, we're going to switch now to the next phase. I can't even begin in one talk to tell you all about the history of this 1920s, 1930 period. But if you're interested in it, Paul Wessling of the IEEE has a marvelous talk. It's a little over one hour. And these are the links. And incidentally, all these slides will be available to everyone. 
I highly recommend it. Oh, and by the way, one other thing happened in the 1930s. Fred Terman went to David Packard and Bill Hewlett and said, why don't you two guys form a company? And yet Hewlett Packard in 1939 was formed. This is the historic plaque. It's titled Birthplace of Silicon Valley. I think you can argue that there are other birthplaces and birth times of Silicon Valley. This is one interpretation. I want you to note one other thing. They started in a garage, pretty shabby garage. Now in Silicon Valley, it's really good to start in a garage. Cisco Systems started in a garage. Apple started in a garage. And I can go down a whole long list. I remember John Morbridge at Cisco System one day arguing that Cisco Systems garage was a whole lot nicer than Hewlett Packard's garage. Well, does that matter? I don't know. So along comes World War II. And what we see is an incredible escalation in the importance of technology. Example. This is the Palo Alto Times, January 30th, 1939. It announces that at Stanford they've invented the Klystron. They actually had invented it a little before then. But this was a story on the front page of the Palo Alto Times about the development of this Klystron. Look at the other headline. Hitler warns, let us alone, denies plan to attack other lands. He must have lied, not surprisingly. So where do we go then? World War II starts. Now, we came into the war a little later. England declared war on Germany after Poland was invaded by the German army. And it was fortunate that England had put along its coast a radar to detect the incoming aircraft from Germans. And this work goes back to Robert Watson Watt. In 1935, he was asked, we've heard there is a death ray the Germans have developed. Could you investigate that? And he took several people in his organization. They looked at it and they said, no, no death ray. But by the way, radar could be very useful. And so by the time Hitler unleashed the bombers on London and the Battle of Britain occurred with the Spitfires against the German bombers. England had forewarning. They could launch the Spitfires to intercept the bombers using the radar signals. And you can see the approximate range, it, not too far, but it gave them adequate warning to, to launch their aircraft. This was called the chain home radar, and this is one of the examples of the chain home radar. By the way, all the time of the war, the Germans bombed England. The Germans never figured out that that was the radar, and they never attacked a single radar unit. However, Rudolf Knoll in Germany, 1934, had the same ideas about radar. And what we discovered in World War II is Germany had the most sophisticated radar air defense system in the world. It's called the Kammhuber line. And it linked early warning of bombers or aircraft coming over the European continent. It was linked through, not computers at that time, but it was linked through a telephone system that allowed very quick alerts throughout Europe. And they could launch their fighter aircraft to intercept bombers. They used radar to direct flak artillery. And they used radar on German interceptors at night to intercept 
the British bombers. And in fact, the strategy of the Allies in World War II was they were going to destroy German industry. The Germans had a superior military at the time, but they had to have war material and the gasoline and other supplies to keep their war machine going. And so the plan was to bomb Germany and the areas that it occupied with these bombers. And of course, you probably know something about the story there. Their losses were tremendous. The Germans in the beginning were very effective in shooting down and destroying these bombers. And the bombers weren't very accurate in the beginning of the war. Many of them were lucky at night to be within five miles of their target when they dropped their bombs. So it wasn't very effective. But this was the strategy of the Allies. And to counter it, the Germans had this Freya early morning radar. It had a range of about uh, 120 miles. They built about 100 of these, and it was introduced in 1939. Fairly early radar. These were backed up by the Würzburg radar. The G Germans put about 1,500 of these in place, and these were what were used to give signals to the German interceptors to intercept the bombers. I think one thing that's very interesting, they were operating at 560 megahertz. That was a relatively high frequency in those days for radar. That was actually, with that parabolic dish, those were quite accurate in terms of pinpointing where the bombers were. And they also put radar on German aircraft to intercept the bombers, especially for night or when it was very cloudy and overcast over Europe. And these were also quite effective, but this was a much lower frequency radar and it had about an eight kilometer, about a four and a half mile range. The most effective use of radar by the Germans was their flak guns. And what they would do is they would, through radar, determine the height or the altitude of the bombers. They would then use fragmentation rounds that were fused by time because they knew the velocity of the shells and that's the way they put up flak to destroy the bombers. So at that time then they had the Doppler radar then, right? Yeah, the Germans were quite sophisticated. I'm only tell, giving you a drop in the bucket of what is known about what was done in radar during World War II. It's an incredible story. And by the way, it wasn't just England and Germany. We had a radar effort at MIT at the Radiation Laboratory. And people don't talk a lot of, about it very much, but Japan had a radar effort. And I've actually seen some of the radar units that they put on Ger uh, Japanese submarines. So they had waveguide and they were quite sophisticated. So what are you gonna do about all of this? You gotta have countermeasures. Can you jam the radar? Can you spoof or fool the radar? So it was realized that we had such heavy losses from the bombing that we couldn't continue indefinitely unless we made dramatic strides in protecting those bombers. And so it was decided by Vannevar Bush, who had been at MIT, he headed the Office of Strategic R&D. He reported to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's the one who started the Manhattan Project for the atomic bomb. He's the one who set up MIT's radiation laboratory. He also set up something else that you may never have heard of, the Radio Research Laboratory at Harvard University. And originally, Bush chose Louis Alvarez, the PhD Nobel winning physicist at UC Berkeley to head it. And Alvarez said no. I want to work on the atomic bomb. By the way, Alvarez actually wrote in the tale operating instruments when the second atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. So Alvarez said, well, I won't do it, but I recommend somebody, and this was a surprise, Fred Terman, a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford to do this. And so Terman was chosen and this was the solution. It grew to be about an 800-person laboratory. 
It's hard to find very much information about it, but their mission was to understand German and Japanese radar, to find a way to counter it, to use signal intelligence in various countermeasures to either jam or fool the radar, and then to develop, that was at MIT, radar for bombers so they could more accurately bomb. Those two organizations worked very closely together. Of course, they were next to each other, Harvard and MIT. So Fred Terman was chosen to do this. And Terman, Terman did a superb job. He was the right person for that job. One of the things they did, and incidentally, the RRL did not develop these aluminum strips called shaft, or is actually the, the name during World War II was window for that. You didn't talk about shaft, you talked about window. That was the code name for it. Fred Terman spent six weeks in England examining what we knew, or what they knew at that time about German radar. And he picked up on this shaft, and he went back and he asked Fred Whipple, who was an astronomer, to look into it in more detail. And they actually worked out a complete theory based upon all the various German radar frequencies of how to optimize the shaft. And the story goes that three quarters of all the aluminum foil in the United States was actually used over Europe. They covered Europe with aluminum. But while it was floating down, these strips of aluminum, being the right size, would reflect German radar back. They would get these huge clouds of, sh of shaft and conf confuse the radar. And there were many other projects. There were almost 100 projects at RRL. They developed the mandrel and the carpet jammers. They developed something called tuba that wasn't really all that successful. But look at this. It radiated energy was such that lighted fluorescent bulbs a mile away and jammed many German radars in France. So that's kind of an interesting project. If you want to know more about this, there is a guy by the name of Steve Blank, who's very heavily uh, involved in entrepreneurial operations, who has given some very nice talks on this. And he calls it the secret history of Silicon Valley. He makes a very interesting statement. The valley as we know it today starts with Fred Terman. And that's what I'm going to try to show you in the next few slides. World War II ended, but then the Cold War began. Now, I'm old enough to have lived through most of the Cold War. Just a few highlights. Stalin wanted to gather as many satellite nations in Eastern Europe as he could to engulf them in communism. Winston Churchill, as early as March in 1946, just a few months after the end of World War II, gave his famous Iron Curtain, Iron Curtain speech. And we had the Tr Truman Doctrine declaring that we were going to protect the peoples of Europe as well as, as best we could. We had the Berlin blockade. The Soviet Union dropped their atomic bomb in August of 1949, five years after the United States had one. Mainland China fell to communism, and the United States started to get very worried what was happening in the Cold War. It led to the Korean War, Hungarian Revolution, and other things. So that's a thumbnail history of the Cold War it ended in 1991. <coughs> what happened? Well, when our soldiers and personnel came back from World War II, everybody was sick of war. It was a truly a national effort. Women worked in the factories producing war material. America wanted to get back to being normal. And something interesting happened. The FCC in 1945, out of the blue, primarily at the lobbying of RCA, incidentally, changed the frequency band from 42 to 50 megahertz for FM radio up to 88 to 108 megahertz. 
And lo and behold, the RCA and GE tubes didn't work. But IMAX tubes did. They now own this market. And Silicon Valley becomes dominant in high-frequency vacuum tubes. And that's going to prove to be really important in the Cold War. Because now we're going to have the spook program through the CIA and the NSA and et cetera. Because Russia being the enemy in the Cold War, we've got to know everything we can about them. By the way, Lytton was involved, his name comes up again, producing high power flystrums. They went up to 30 megawatts in pulse power. That's incredible. Now, one little side light I threw in here that I normally would never do is because Hewlett Packard put up a plant in 1972 in Santa Rosa. They're now known as Keysight. Where did they come from? Well, that plant, Keysight, is microwave. The Varian brothers who did the Kleistrons, <coughs> they had to make their own microwave instruments to measure what they had, but they didn't want that business. They just wanted to make the, the Kleistron tubes. So they said to Hewlett Packard, for $20,000, we'll sell you all of our IP. And that launched Hewlett Packard in 1948 into microwave. And the microwave division in Hewlett Packard became the dominant division. A little bit of uh, side light that affects us. So the America started doing countermeasures and trying to determine what was going on in the Soviet Union, gathering electronic intelligence, signal intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. The usual organizations that do this. Okay. During the 1950s, we lost a number of aircraft that were flying, gathering that kind of data. And as the Soviets became better and better at this, what happened? Uh, is, there, is it the time now that the synthetic aperture radar then? Uh, I, I, I thought it was the The Soviets basically used German radar initially. I see. They took the scientists in Germany that had done that, okay. and that's what they, that was their starting point. Yeah, but if you were to, to uh, go over a, a, a land or I mean, the future, they needed to have the uh, synthetic aperture radar. Yeah. And the question is that, was it invented around that time, 1950s or what? Well, this is, this is in the early, this starts in the early 50s. Right. It actually started a little bit before that. Uh, yeah. But what they're doing is they're taking aircraft that they already have and they're loading up with lots of instrumentation right. to take measurements. And the kind of thing they were looking for is the tall king Soviet radar. You know, note this is a mobile radar. Soviet Union employed 700 of these and they were mobile and if the United States ever had to attack Russia or the Soviet Union I should say with B-52 bombers in a nuclear war they had to know where these radars were and so the Strategic Air Command of the United States Air Force was very interested in this data. Well you can't just fly anywhere over the Soviet Union so what did we do? We said well, let's fly higher the U-2, and eventually the Blackbird or the Oxcart SR-71. These were platforms that were flown over the Soviet Union until the Soviet Union finally got the technology to shoot them down, gathering all of this electronic intelligence data. But what really shook the United States was Sputnik. When Sputnik was launched, by the Soviet Union. It was a dramatic impact. Sputnik in the United States created the perception of American weakness, complacency, and a missile gap. Eventually came out of this in the 1960 presidential election. And it dramatically changed the Cold War. And it, in many ways, was very advantageous to the technologists because it led to the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was one of the creators of the ARPANET. National Defense Education Act pumped an incredible amount of money into American universities. Started the space race. You know all the story of that. The National Science Foundation's allocation was dramatically increased because of Sputnik. 
And in the Bay Area, what was happening? Lockheed in 1956 arrived. Just one of a number of companies, but this was the big one. They made the Polaris missile, submarine launch ballistic missile. They had zero employees in 1956. In the Bay Area by 1960, they employed 20,000 people. The Bay Area had become an area where munitions and war material was being produced. Now enter Fred Turman, amateur radio enthusiast. He went, he got his degree in electrical engineering at Stanford, but he went to MIT to get his doctorate. And when he came back, he began teaching at Stanford. And one of the dramatic things is he published one of the most useful books. This is the fourth edition of his electronic and radio engineering book. This is still useful today. This is how Fred Terman got to be known in electrical engineering departments all around the United States and in Europe. So he served as the IRE, Institute of Radio Engineers. Now we call it the IEEE. That's how he got to be known by many people. He had worked for the Niebuhr Bush, who became the head of the US Office of Scientific R&D. And that's how he was appointed the director of the Radio Research Laboratory at Harvard to do electronic countermeasures. He learned a lot there. Stanford University was not very important as a university before World War II. Fred Terman came back from the Radio Research Laboratory and said, that's going to change. They had a plan, a master plan. He's often called the father of the Silicon Valley. A.H. said, well, we're going to start with our focus on microwaves and electronics. He brought a number of people from the radio research lab back to serve as faculty members at Stanford. Some of the companies around Stanford also hired people from the radio research lab. See, Terman knew who was good and who wasn't. He established the electronics research laboratory that was targeted at doing electronics research and much of it defense oriented. And he started the applied electronics laboratories which did classified research on campus. And what he achieved is by the mid 1950s, Stanford was being funded almost as well as MIT. In fact, some people called Stanford the MIT of the West Coast. And here was his plan, steeples of excellence. A university department has to do some things better than everyone else. You can't do everything better than everyone else, but you have to have something that is truly <coughs> above everyone else because that attracts research funding and the best students. He had a lot of contacts, so he knew where to go in the government to get funding. He created administrative guidelines that was very beneficial to this environment. He's was part of the starting of the Stanford Industrial Park, where companies would be located next to the university, and the university and the companies could interact very closely. See, Stanford was very lucky. They were endowed by Leland Stanford with over 8,000 acres. That's about 13 square miles. He started an honors co-op program, so these companies next to Stanford could take their engineers with bachelor's degrees, and without leaving work, they could earn a master's degree from Stanford. And he encouraged faculty and students <coughs> to start companies. And if you go to Stanford and talk to the people in, in the department that does industrial relations, they'll tell you that they can count about 6,000 companies that emerged from Stanford. Google, Hewlett Packard, and I could keep going, Yahoo, they all came from Stanford. Okay, so Terman introduced weapons research at Stanford University. By 1968, about 20% of the electronics research was actually weapons related. Not all of it, but a good part of it. The Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park had about half of their funding 
And that came to an end in 1969, Vietnam War. Student demonstrations at Stanford, we don't want war research. Stanford agreed, we will get rid of it. But by this time, Stanford was so heavily involved in non-war related things, it didn't really make much difference. During the critical period of their growth, they had phenomenal growth from 1945 to 1955. So Steve Blank would tell you, well, here's <coughs> the formula, Silicon Valley as we know it, starts here. What he means is graduate students are encouraged to start companies. Professors are encouraged to consult for these companies. Terman and other professors take board seats. Well, that was convenient. Technology transfer. Stanford makes it easy to get IP transfer. Something invented at Stanford. You want to license it and use it? Easy to do. Of course, Stanford makes money off of it. Getting out in the real world is good for your academic career. And by the way, failure is OK. OK, Stanford also serves as a port of entry to Silicon Valley. Draws, because of its reputation, a lot of researchers and top talent to the university, which then fan out to industry in Silicon Valley. Back to Terman. Professor John Linville was hired by Fred Terman. And he made an interesting observation. He said Fred Terman had a remarkable way of keeping track of people. He knew where they were. Fred Herman really cared about his students. He put a lot of them together to start companies, like Hewlett and Packard. He followed them. He knew where they were working a few years after they had graduated. And he actually helped them find other positions that were better for them. Fred Terman was really cons very conscientious and concerned about his students. He looked after them. Terman hired Linville, and it was Linville's responsibility was to transistorize the curriculum at Stanford's electrical engineering department. And this brings us to the big step now. The semiconductor revolution drives the age of computation. Or how silicon came to be integrated into Silicon Valley. Where did the silicon come from? Well, Bill Shockley with Ratton and Bardeen discovered the transistor. By the way, Shockley during the war was director of anti-submarine warfare operations, which actually dealed with, dealt with radar. He, did, he was head of the radar bombing training and so forth. Do you think he knew Fred Terman from the radio research lab? Of course. <laughs> so Shock, uh, Shockley was lobbied by Terman and Linville to start a company. Shockley wanted to leave Bell Labs and start a company. He wanted to cash in on the great invention of the transistor. And they convinced him to come to Palo Alto, or the San Francisco Bay Area. And this is the next crucial company, a little company called Shockley Semiconductor. I used to go buy this every day when I lived in the Bay Area. It, for many years, it became a, after Shockley Semiconductor folded, it became a fruit stand, but an extremely important company. A humble start. You know Shockley? That's a misnomer. So Shockley, also his mother lived in Palo Alto. That was a big factor. And Stanford for Shockley's coming and starting a semiconductor company said, we'll give you a faculty position at Stanford. And Professor Jim Gibbons will work half time at Shockley Semiconductor to set up an identical facility at Stanford University. How do you think Stanford got into the integrated circuit business eventually? This was the avenue that they started with. But Shockley was a very poor manager. And so he hired some very good people they left in 1957, and what did they do? They started Fairchild Semiconductor. And you can argue that might be the most important company in Silicon Valley because they were the in, one of the co-inventors of the integrated circuit. This was a dynamo for new ideas 
and new companies. What really made it go was Jean Hernier, one of the traitorous eight that left Shockley Semiconductor, founded the planar patent. And that's the patent upon which integrated circuits today are built. That was the most important patent I can think of in the semiconductor industry. But Fairchild couldn't keep all their people, and so they went off and started a lot of companies. In fact, if you, this is only a partial list. The who's who in semiconductors came out of Fairchild. And all of this led to this wonderful thing called Moore's Law, which I talked about a few months ago. <coughs> and this led to microprocessors of incredible power, semiconductor memory. And that leads us then really to the next step, the age of computation. Because these integrated circuits made it possible for small computers. The initially mainframe computers were it. The Digital Equipment Corporation came along and said, well, I know you can't, most people can't afford a mainframe, but we can make a small size, well, it wasn't so small at that time, but a less expensive computer than what IBM will lease you. And so, in 1957, DEC was founded. It was a great idea. It's one of the most successful companies, not in Silicon Valley, but along Route 128 in Boston. And that company failed. And that's going to lead to the personal computer. Why did DEC fail? This could be a clue. So being smart is not enough. There were a lot of visionaries like Steve Jobs that realized that a personal computer had great value. How many of you have heard of Xerox Park down in Palo Alto? They, you can argue, really made the first PC. This was their Alto computer. By the way, why is the screen this way? Well, if you're going to work on 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper, that's the way you want the screen oriented, right? And this computer had a bitmap display it used three-button mouse, there's the three-button mouse. It used graphical windows, it used Ethernet. Early drawing from Robert Metcalf about Ethernet. He went on to found 3Com, very successful company. Now, Xerox failed to, to capitalize on this. Remember, Xerox was the great copier company. They made wonderful copiers. They made an incredible amount of money off of those. They wanted to protect that market. Here's what Steve Jobs said. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry, could have been the IBM of the 90s, could have been the Microsoft of the 90s, but they didn't. Why was that? Well, maybe it's Shirky's principle. Institutions will try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. I'm making a lot of money on Xerox copiers. Why would I want to introduce something to upset that? Moral of the story, if you don't obsolete yourself, others will. Okay. Also coming out of Xerox Park in 1973, Alan Kay said, wouldn't it be great if we had a notebook? This didn't work. This was just a mock-up. They didn't have the technology in 1973 to do that. Look who followed up on it. Steve Jobs. Technology has its time. One quick commercial. If you haven't visited the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View, you should. Okay, finally, well, we get to the Internet, because with the ending of the Cold War, all this defense spending went away. The internet took its place in all the kinds of companies that came along with it. Silicon Valley reinvented itself to take the next step. So, let's make, in the last few minutes, some summary and conclusions. Why was Silicon Valley so 
successful? Well, I'm going to list a few. Very positive business environment. It rewarded risk taking and tolerated failure. It has a results oriented meritocracy. If you want to be recognized in Silicon Valley, do something big. Do something successful. Very spirited cooperation, a sharing culture. Think back to the amateur radio enthusiast. High quality mobile workforce. Companies are their people. No doubt about that. It had an incredibly large concentration of highly educated people in all technical disciplines, quite frankly. And it had the reputation to draw people. It had cultural diversity, so it attracted the best talent from everywhere. Immigration was a huge role in Silicon Valley. Today, over 50% of startups are from immigrants. Professional networking. Engineers from India have networks that they talk to each other, although they work at different companies and so forth. It's a very widespread sharing of technical knowledge. And by the way, California is interesting because it has something called a non-compete uh, that is prohibited. Non-compete agreements tie you down. If you leave a company and they say, well, you know a lot about our technology, you can't ha take a job that will use it. They want to protect. Back in 1872, California said no. It's been common practice in California not to prosecute trade secret violations. That encouraged the sharing of ideas. So all those engineers left Fairchild and they took all the knowledge that they had learned at Fairchild. I mean, they couldn't steal the documents or the hardware, but they could take the intellectual property that they retained in their mind and they started other companies that were highly successful. Well, there are a few more things that I would list. California mindset and cultures, freewheeling, libertarian, in a sense, and hippie culture of the early 60s and 70s. Don't downplay that. That's important. Or as Aaron Rao says, the role of the eccentric independent. You have a great idea, nobody else agrees, don't give up yet. Be independent. Private sector, academia, and government cooperate surprisingly well. Universities and research institutes constructively interact with industry. Here's an important one, number eight. You have the supporting infrastructure in Silicon Valley. You have the finance side with venture capitalists, angel investors, accounting firms, consultants, legal re resources, human resource search firms, numerous professional organizations. Very, very important. There are, is a culture among venture capitalists and angel investors to be very helpful to young entrepreneurs. They provide mentoring, guidance, and range connections. That's extremely important. What they're really doing is they have a high level of reinvestment. And finally, well, if you're in an environment where people are enthusiastic about all the successes, it's contagious. Silicon Valley continues to reinvent itself. The Silicon Valley of 1950 is not the Silicon Valley of today. 20 years from now, it'll be very different than what it is today. It has this innate ability to keep reinventing itself. It has a high quality of life, such as climate, beauty of the Bay Area, the urban amenities. I will not mention housing prices, however. Defense funding arrived at critical periods during World War II and the Cold War. That actually played an important role. Stanford University via Fred Terman is a catalyst for entrepreneurship and growth in Silicon Valley. Relatively low level of government regulation and a focus upon the value of inventions and customer use and not upon the invention itself. Many things that Silicon Valley has been successful at, they didn't invent but they took somebody else's invention and improved on its application. And finally, although most lists don't involve this, was there some luck involved? Such as Fred Terman being the right person at the right time in the right place. I think so. I think so. I'll leave you with one final thing. In 1999, Hewlett Packard published the rules of the garage, 
for their people. I'm just going to read a couple points off of this. I think this is very inspirational. Believe you can change the world. Many of the entrepreneurs have been very successful. They weren't there really to get rich. They were there because they thought they could change the world. Steve Jobs was really in that category. Work quickly, keep the tools unlocked, work whenever. Know when to work alone and when to work together. Teamwork. Teamwork at times is absolutely essential. Share your tools and ideas. Trust your colleagues. No politics, no bureaucracy. But they're ridiculous in a garage anyway. The customer defines a job well done, not you. Invent different ways of working. There isn't just one way to work. And if it doesn't contribute, it doesn't leave the garage. And believe that together we can do anything. That's the spirit of Silicon Valley. Questions? Yes? Uh, one part you mentioned that uh, if, uh, let's see, if CC switched to FM, yeah. Range from uh, 250 <clears throat> to 88108. Yeah. Do you know the reasoning? Yes. Of that? RCA wanted to protect their monopoly on AM radio. Oh, AM. Yeah. Because FM was a com competitor. Right. And when they made that frequency change, all that equipment of th about 3 million receivers was obsolete. So, it was, in other words, to RCA's advantage at the time? Or yeah, RCA it? had a lot of radio stations. Yeah. Radio stations. They made a lot of money on them. Yeah. They wanted to protect them. Remember Sharpie's principle? Right. I, I see a lot of that. Yeah, and then, in fact, they were lobbying to the, to the Congress. Yeah. To, you know, yeah, yeah. Sarnoff. David Sarnoff lobbied heavily in Congress. Right. Yeah. Smart guy, but it wasn't beneficial to everybody. And then uh, one, one thing that I can add to your, uh, to your list, uh, it sounded a bit but really crazy, I, I, I left a uh, lot out of this talk, is that a lot of these engineers that you talked about, they, they usually went out of the box and saw outside what's going on and so on. Yeah. You did not stay right in, in the same box. I mean, they did not you know, prison them. I didn't put that because I used copyrighted right. material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but that's exactly right, because you have to think the next step. Here's an invention. A lot of engineers say, oh, this is a wonderful invention. I really like all the details on it. They get focused on the invention. They can't see beyond. That's what Steve Jobs brought. Steve Wozniak at Apple was a technologist. He loved the technology. They went to the, the Jobs and Wozniak went to the Homebrew Computer Club in Palo Alto. And they, Wozniak was going to give the Apple One design away to any hobbyist that wanted it. And Jobs said, no, we're going to turn this into a product. See, Jobs realized there was money to be made because there was, it was fulfilling a need. Wozniak didn't think about that. Wozniak loved the technology and what it could do. And once he had done developing it, then he was on wanted to do the next thing. Jobs was the businessman. He had the foresight and the marketing foresight that allowed Apple to be successful. And when he left, when he was fired, a lot of that left until he came back and refocused the company. So there are a lot of things that have to come together. This is not an entire master list of it. There are probably things I have forgotten or had not included. Because every company is a little different. By the way, if you want the slide set, I have a number of pages of references that you can go to to dig further into this. So yeah, I'm going to distribute the slides. Okay. So this has been uh, I I worked in Silicon Valley in the 1970s. I've had my had a close eye on it ever since, and I know quite a few people down there. And it's a really exciting thing. 80 to 100 miles south of where we are, you go down 101, you'll be in the heart of Silicon Valley. And it's a really contagious atmosphere. Go to the Computer History Museum.
you'll start to sense some of that because some of the docents there developed things along the way in the development of the PC and that type of thing in the Bay Area. So, any other questions? Yeah. I was wondering, what, what do you think was the role of Berkeley in other universities? The role of Berkeley? Oh, Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, I thought about that a lot because I went to Berkeley in undergraduate. So Berkeley was very, was very important in computers. You know, Berkeley, uh, Unix, BSD, uh, they've had some marvelous engineering professors. The problem is this, Stanford had this massive amount of land and Terman had this program where he deliberately focused bringing in government money in the defense area and that gave him a huge financial boost. If Berkeley was not able to do that, that was not acceptable. It's Stanford's a private university, Berkeley's a public university. Now, the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory up on the hill, you know, Livermore did classify things, but it was not directly linked to the electrical engineering faculty, for example, in Berkeley. More on the physics and chemistry and that type of thing. But there were engineers involved also. Berkeley's landlocked. They couldn't expand much. They had some really good people. I think Berkeley provides an outstanding education. I, in an undergraduate, I think Berkeley's superior to Stanford. Don't record that. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah. but, when you go through what Fred Turman did, all the levers he pulled, and all the people he knew, and all the emphasis on, oh, you're a new faculty member, what board are you gonna be on? What company are you gonna start? I remember when I, we sent our son to Stanford, he came home one day and he said, Dad, everybody has a company. The professors all have companies, the research assistants all have companies, most of the grad students have companies, even some of the undergraduates have companies. He got the idea he could go start a company. That's what he learned at Stanford that he, couldn't learn, he wouldn't have learned so quickly at Berkeley. It's that culture at Stanford. You want to be an entrepreneur, it's the culture that they built at Stanford. Yeah, in fact, that's what, what I wanted to add, that really, yeah. they, they train the, the students to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. And that's really important. Now, the other thing, Berkeley focused a lot on the physics department. They did a lot of, they had a number of Nobel Prize winners in the, in the physics department and the chemistry. So, so they are a first-rate university. Their engineering program, in some ways, is better than Stanford's. But Stanford is a research university more than anything else. Berkeley is both undergraduate and research. Because at Berkeley, a faculty member has to teach an undergraduate and a graduate course. That's not true at Stanford. In fact, if you bring in a lot of research dollars, you may not even have to teach. I don't know what the rules are as of today, but I know when I was there, that was the way it worked. By the way, I had my office in the AEL building. I looked at the building and said, you know, it's kind of a strange building. Now I understand. That's where the classified work on campus was done. Yeah, it was a reinforced building. It had some really strange doors. <laughs> so, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much.